Hello and welcome to today's webinar about Indigenous cultural programming. My name is Megan Fro Metcalf and I'm the Outreach and Program Manager at Culture Days. I'm pleased to act as host and moderator today. There's a special webinar in our webinar series running through 2018. We're very excited to have partnered with SAS Culture to create this talk for you today. I would just like to take a moment to thank the Department of Canadian Heritage whose funding made this webinar series and other free professional development resources possible. It's also just a reminder that registration is currently open for the 2018 Culture Days weekend. The dates this year, September 20th to 30th, 2018, need to see all the programs you have planned. So this is just a reminder before I introduce the webinar and our guest speakers of a few little house, housekeeping pieces. The only microphones that will be turned on during the presentation will be the speakers. If you have any questions, please use the question box on your webinar platform. You'll also have the opportunity to have a brief Q&A after each presentation. We're very excited to be hosting today's webinar in partnership with SAS Culture. Since 2010, Culture Days in Saskatchewan has been coordinated by SAS Culture in a variety of ways, such as through the Culture Days Funding Assistance Grant Program with support from Saskatchewan Lottery's Trust Fund for Sport, Culture and Recreation. Before I proceed, I would just like to acknowledge that the land on which I am presenting on today is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. The webinar today was based on feedback from our event organizers and community leads who sought to have guidance on developing programming and partnerships with, with Indigenous groups in their community. Today's speakers will share their knowledge, resources, and guidance for event organizers from their particular perspective in Saskatchewan. I also want to mention the Culture Days theme this year on BEAT, which has an obvious link to the topic of today's webinar. Culture Days has already seen many great programs related to drumming and dancing, and we hope to support the creation of more of these programs ahead of our rhythm-based theme this year. We'll not be leading the discussion today, but I've reached out to our partner, SAS Culture, who will help to provide some insight. In a moment, I'm going to be passing the mic over to Dominga Robertson, our outreach coordinator with SAS Culture. So Dominga Robertson is a Nakota and Jamaican woman from the Pheasant Rump First Nation and says the Saskatchewan. Dominga has Bachelor of Arts in English um, and minors in theatre performance and theatre studies. She is working in community programming for over 15 years. Dominga began her professional career in SAS culture with the goal to gain understanding of what cultural funding organizations are looking for in community programming and grant applications. Her passes include working as an independent curator, event coordinator for various culture, cultural and educational organizations, such as the Cultural and Ceremonies Manager for the 24 North American Indigenous Games, and as the Indigenous Program Coordinator for the Saskatchewan Writers Guild. Domingo will discuss some of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, issues around cultural appropriation and terminology, treaty, ter treaty territory statements, and more. Following Domingo's talk, we'll hear two case studies from Saskatchewan about successful programs. Christine Vandermeer holds a BAH in psychology from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where her family moved from Holland when she was seven years old. In her role as coordinator of education with the RCMP Heritage Center, she's had the opportunity to explore and teach aspects of multiculturalism as related to indigenous communities, newcomers, government, and policing. Christine is currently an education coordinator with the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan, where she'll be speaking from today. The Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan is committed to promoting, fostering, improving, and developing multiculturalism in the cultural, economic, social, and civil political life of Saskatchewan, while working to achieve equality for all of its residents. Following Christine's presentation, we'll hear from Chantelle Amstad. Chantelle grew up in Quebec and graduated from the University of Laval with a bachelor's degree in public affairs and international relations. She moved to Saskatchewan two years ago and works at the at the Association Communitaire Francoise de Moustra, or Moustra's French Community Association, as the community director since 2017. The associ association is a nonprofit organization that has had the mission to promote French and, French and French Canadian culture to offer Moustra's French speaking community opportunities to get together. So now I'm going to be passing the presentation over to Dominga for her to start talking about all of her important details. All right, Dominga, we can see you. If you just want to share your screen. 
Am I sharing? Am I good? Yes, you're all good. We can hear you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Megan has said, I'm Dominga Robinson. I'm one of the outreach consultants with SAS Culture, um, and I'm here today to talk to you about Indigenous inclusion in events. Um, first off, I'm going to start off a little bit about who SAS Culture is. Um, we are a nonprofit organization who administers the lottery funds in Saskatchewan to cultural programs. So we have quite a wide berth um, and I am the one who is responsible for the Culture Days Funding Assistance Program in our office. Um, I would like to start off by acknowledging that I am coming to you from the Treaty 4 territory in Regina and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Um, and I wanted to give a little bit of a disclaimer that I am, yes I am responsible for the grant and yes I do work in this industry but I don't really paint myself as an expert with there's people out there who do this as a full-time job so I'm just going to provide you with the best practices and tips that I am aware of through my experiences. So yes, SAS culture, we're all about not, uh, provincial cultural organizations and support. So first off, I'm gonna start off by framing the conversation around the TRC calls to action. Um, if you're unfamiliar with them, I'm gonna give you a little bit of synopsis on what has happened there. Over a number of years, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission traveled across the country and uh, gathered up witness statements from people who were residential school survivors. This was an opportunity for them to tell their truth um, as opposed to some of the versions of what residential schools were prior to their, their speaking up. So they gathered up all of these things. Um, I have provided a link in my PowerPoint there to the consultations. I encourage people to go in and listen to those stories. Um, once you hear from the words of the people who actually attended these residential schools, you can see how the impact of that can still be affecting people today. It's really hard to, to deny that truth. Um, after their completion of their consultations, what they came out with was a report, which was 94 calls to actions that were directed towards the government as well as individuals in our country to um, address reconciliation and start to rebuild that relationship after the trust had been destroyed through residential schools over hundreds of years. Um, so yeah, these are the TRC calls to action are really important uh, to be aware of. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out. A number of them are directed specifically at the culture industry and we need to be aware of these we need to be working towards these goals uh, so the areas up on the screen on the presentation there are the areas that the trc calls have direct actions towards our industry on so specifically language and culture museums and archives have been um have brought in about repatriation and cultural appropriation. You have education system that has been implicated in this and how do we teach people about Indigenous culture. Commemoration, National Indigenous Peoples Day, which was just last week. Uh, media and their portrayal of Indigenous people, as well as the education of newcomers to Canada and providing them with the factual history that actually happened here. So I encourage everyone to read up on the TRC calls to action and know where it aligns with your work and, and your personal life as well and things that you can do to take action. I have provided a link here as well to the full calls to action report. Uh, and there's these little tiny books that are out there in the world, um, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, calls to action. I usually carry these around with me um, and if there's any chance for something like this to come up in a conversation or in a meeting, I am pulling out my calls to action and determining how we are working towards those things. So with that framework in mind, with reconciliation and telling the truth and inclusion of Indigenous people being, you know, something that's very important to our country at this point, I'm going to talk now about the benefits of inclusion. Um, so inclusion is gonna build community. It's gonna to help to break down those barriers. It's gonna to help to erase the stereotypes. It's gonna create relationships. Once you can create relationships within the community, you're gonna see that those barriers are broken down. Um, you're also going to see that you're gonna have new audience and volunteers coming to your events and your activities. So I know as cultural organizations probably across the country are feeling, it's it can be challenging to build new audiences. It can be challenging to get volunteers. Well, the, if 
if you build in Indigenous programming into what you're doing, you're going to access those people. People like to see themselves represented in an organization and then they will participate. Uh, this is also going to help potentially with your organizational diversity as you build those relationships and start to adjust your programming to include what you're going to find is that your organization is going to attract diverse people and you may even uh, individually your intercultural competencies will grow the more you engage with this type of work. Um, having Indigenous people around is going to help you to avoid cultural appropriation. I'll get into a little bit more uh, about cultural appropriation in a few minutes here, but uh, yeah, that's what that's about is uh, avoiding cultural appropriation, allowing you to be responsive to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls of action, and the biggest benefit of it is that it's the right thing to do. No one likes to exclude a certain group of people or do a multiculturalism event, but have every culture but the Indigenous people there present. So it's the right thing to do, and we really, really strongly encourage people to work towards Indigenous inclusion. Um, indigenous nations, now I'll give a little bit of context here. There are over 600 different groups in Canada alone. There are even more across North America. All of them are quite distinct and diverse and uh, have their own ways of doing things. Um, so I encourage everyone to learn about the tribes that are present in your area. Megan, when she gave the intro this morning, was very good to introduce the tribes that are uh, uh, the traditional lands that they are on. So learn about who is in your area. In Saskatchewan, we have several already uh, that we I, I acknowledge and work to to uh, to include. So each tribe is going to have their own community. They're going to have their own traditions. They're going to have their own protocols. There is no one size fit all. There's not going to be anyone who's going to be able to tell you this is exactly how this is going to go because it varies per community. Even within tribes, you'll find different communities have different traditional practices. So um, just be respectful and ask questions. I always like to ask locals how things will go, um, local people, and build those relationships through them. Uh, if I am going to ask an elder for assistance, I'm generally going to offer tobacco before asking for that help, just out of respect. There is some protocol there that usually uh, usually is the case. I'm not going to say it's the case across the country, but I can tell you here in Saskatchewan, that's usually how we do things is we offer tobacco. Um, I'm going to talk now about treaty and territory statements. So as you learn who those people are and whose land you're residing on, um, I encourage you to acknowledge your treaties and in, in, the, in the tribal lands that you are on. Uh, as the Office of the Treaty Commissioner says, we are all treaty people, so you need to learn those things. In BC and in some of the northern areas of the country, they don't have treaties, um, so that it is an acknowledgement of the tribal territory that you are residing on. Those acknowledgements need to be authentic. They need to be paying homage to the agreement that the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people have made that have allowed us all to reside on these lands, uh, these buildings, these cities, these these communities are all as a result of those treaties. So really make sure those are heartfelt and you're not just saying the words, that you really are understanding why you're saying those words. Proper terminology, getting into wording. Let's talk about some proper terminology here. Uh, when you do know which tribe you're dealing with, I encourage you to use those tribal affiliations when addressing people. I am a Nakota woman, so I prefer to be called Nakota woman. I can be called an Indigenous woman or a First Nations woman. Those things are all okay. But if you can get a little bit more specific into what exact tribe you're dealing with um, and working with, then I would encourage you to use that terminology. Keep in mind there are distinctions and very, very strong distinctions between First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Indigenous is an, a term that's inclusive of those three groups, but even within those groups there's diverse, there's tons of diversity, so uh, keep that in mind. Aboriginal uh, is kind of outdated, it is fading out. Uh, you'll still see it around here and there, but most people are now switching from Aboriginal to Indigenous, which is a word that has come from the community where Aboriginal was something that actually came government down. So I would encourage you to try to shift over to terminology around Indigenous as opposed to Aboriginal. 
Never use the term Indian um, unless you're actually referencing Canadian legal and government policies and historical information. Uh, Indian is not a, um, an appropriate term anymore unless you're referencing something like the Indian Act, which in case that you're not going to be able to change that terminology of that historical document. Um, when in doubt, ask people. <laughs> they will tell you. If you ask me what I would like to be called, I'll tell you I'm a Nakota and Jamaican woman or a First Nations and Jamaican woman, but I, 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 I will answer that question if asked. So just ask people what they'd like to be called. They'll tell you. So. Here's some improper terminology. Now I've provided a list here on the screen of some of the terms then and sayings that people say casually in conversation that maybe are, are they're actually quite offensive, a lot of these terms, and we need to move away from these things. If you accidentally drop these things in the middle of trying to engage with Indigenous community, they may not want to work with you anymore. It's very touchy, uh, so be careful on these things. The first one around our Indigenous people, that is something I hear quite common commonly and I'm going to discourage you from saying our indigenous people that implies an ownership of indigenous people and not a nation to nation respect that needs to be there um, it is a paternalistic term of ownership so just don't use say our indigenous people say the indigenous people <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through all of these terms as to why they are uh, offensive but as you can kind of see, they are taking some of the things that, some of the tragedies and things that have happened to Indigenous people and making light of them through terminologies and taking some of the things that are sacred to us as well and um, making jokes of them. So please don't use those ones. Cultural appropriation. Um, these are some examples up on the screen here of some some cultural appropriation. Uh, when I think of cultural appropriation, I think of an, an entity, an individual taking a portion of indigenous culture. Uh, usually this is a non-indigenous person taking indigenous culture, even though cultural appropriation can happen within the culture. Um, it is taking those sacred items, those designs and patterns, and taking them and utilizing them to try to make a profit or to try to uh, manipulate them in certain ways. You can see through those images of the gentleman with the suit that they're, they haven't quite got it right. And those images on that gentleman's outfit there are family and, and have been given to them in ceremony. It is something that's sacred and shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, it is really offensive to have a, a a dominant group taking the t who may have negative stereotypes of a certain culture taking elements of that culture and turning around and making jokes of it um, or trying to utilize it to make a profit I'm not an expert on cultural appropriation by any means um, so I provided a, an uh, the Wikipedia version of the definition of this, which is adoption of elements of a minority culture by members of the dominant culture. And those cultural elements may have a deep meaning to the original culture and may be reduced to exotic fashion or toys by those of the dominant culture. So last year, uh, SAS Culture held a panel discussion on cultural appropriation where we gathered up some of the prominent Indigenous artists and, and cultural workers from our area and had them sit down and discuss this. There is a video link there to a YouTube video of that discussion. I really encourage you to go in there and listen to what they have to say. These are the experts in these areas and can give some great insight into what cultural appropriation is, how to avoid it, um, and and moving forward with that topic. On to relationship building. Uh, relationship building. I'm going to give you some do's and don'ts on these types of things. A lot of this is common sense, but I'm going to lay it out for you just so you're kind of clear. Uh, this is going to take time. Uh, there's been a lot of mistrust that's been built within Indigenous community with working with non-Indigenous people. This goes back to residential school stuff. This goes back to government policies that are implemented that continue to suppress Indigenous people. So as a result of those things, there's a lack of trust there. So it's going to take time. You're not going to be able to rush in and get this, like meet, have one meeting and build a relationship and build uh, that that programming or that that 
outcome that you're looking for, it's going to take time to build that trust. So I'm going to encourage you to be patient as you go about trying to build these relationships. Um, also, face-to-face -face meetings are a better way to do this. Trying to do it on the phone is not you're usually going to not be very successful in that. I really encourage you to either go out to the reserve or host them uh, within your organization to start to build those relationships face to face. Uh, that's just the better way to build relationships in general. Ask questions. Just ask the questions. Don't make any assumptions. Just ask people what they want to do, ask them how to approach people. Don't be afraid to ask the questions in, ca in, in case of being offensive. Um, most Indigenous people are going to be quite open and receptive to educating and um, engaging in a positive way. Uh, you just have to ask those questions. Um, you're going to want to be respectful and compassionate. Uh, please have an understanding that most Indigenous communities are struggling with poverty at these moments. And sometimes building a relationship with you or focusing on cultural programming is not going to be their priority. It may be there's a death in the community that they need to adjust things for. It may be that they're worried about addiction issues or housing issues or running their community may take priority over building a relationship relationship with you. So please have some understanding about that um, and be a little bit compassionate. Educate yourself. Know as much as you can before walking in. Um, yes, you are free to ask questions, but if they're pretty common questions and things that you probably could have found out with a little bit of research, that might not make things go as smoothly. So I encourage people to really learn as much about the TRC calls, learning about the Indian Act, learning about UNDRIP. Learning about these things is going to help you to have a better footing when you are trying to engage. Uh, I want to encourage also the allowing for space and Indigenous voices in your planning. A lot of times we'll see. Um, organizations and communities plan an event, want to include Indigenous people, and they go to them after they've done all of the planning to hire. And uh, they are not at that point a part of the, the engagement. It's not a true collaboration at that point. So you need to leave space for them to come in and maybe they don't want to bring dancers. Maybe they want to bring hand games. Maybe they want to do language. You got to give that space for whatever it is that they are looking to engage with. You got to have mutual respect there. And be flexible with things, uh, being able to adjust, to compromise, and relax. <laughs> I'm going to say that, that a lot of times Indigenous people are, you know, uh, we like to have fun with things. We like to laugh. We like to joke around. So be be okay with those things and, and relax. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to not take this as seriously um, and, and just kind of chill out with things a bit sometimes. Here's some don'ts. Um, don't assume anything. Don't assume because this is the way it was last time that it'll be this way this time. Don't assume that this tribe did it this way, that that's how this tribe will do it. Don't make any assumptions. Ask those questions and get clarification on everything. Don't just hire and tokenize like I was speaking about before where you just hire Indigenous dancers to come and perform as part of your culture days. You really kind of want to build it with them and, and, and in collaboration. Don't use the improper terminology I was referencing before. Uh, those things will be remembered. <laughs> they leave marks uh, and, and stains. So uh, just avoid those. Don't engage in cultural appropriation. Don't exclude Indigenous people because it's challenging to build those relationships. Uh, it is some work, but it's going to benefit you way more to include Indigenous people than it will not. And then don't use Indigenous people as, a, as that token. Just because you've talked to one person in a community does not mean the, the entire community endorses what you're doing. You're going to want to have a couple of bases there um, and have a number of people behind supporting what you're doing, especially when it's community-based programming. I'm going to give you an example here of uh, an, an inclusion example. Articulate Inc. and Segeuac Artist Collective partnered um, to do some youth art workshops. So the first one that they held was held in Regina and it was specifically targeted to at-risk youth. 
And they brought those kids into the Articulate Ink space and they gave them the opportunity to create their own designs, to learn some drawing techniques and learning some printing. Uh, and then they did some printmaking techniques. Uh, they were it, under the um, under the watch of a cultural advisor who was helping them to guide through any of the cultural uh, things that they wanted to do um, to make sure that they weren't appropriating their own cultures. And um, yeah, that was a little bit about that. And then they took them and took that show on the road out to the Pasqua First Nation, where they were able to engage at the powwow with another group of youth and getting them learning about this. So you can see that this was mutually beneficial to Articulate Inc., who got to engage with printmaking with youth. And it was uh, mutually a, a, a beneficial for Sagiwak Artist Collective and that they got to engage with and potentially build new Indigenous artists. This summer coming up, the Man Art Gallery has partnered with the Atakaku Cree First Nations. They're going to be holding Cree Summer Language and Culture Camp. Uh, they're going to take the kids out for five days, 15 youth, and they'll have them partnered with elders who will lead workshops on ribbon skirt making, medicine picking, traditional storytelling, spoken word poetry, art performance, visual art, moose, moose hide preparation, and tanning. They will be doing this bilingually with um, the elders and leaders speaking Cree and then translating it into English so that the kids are there's an infusion of language which I'm assuming is a Takaku Cree First Nations' priority with art which is the Man Art Gallery's mandate. So you can see another great collaboration of organizations coming together and building a program together. Um, and with that, I'm not going to go on and on. Um, I'm going to give you some resources here on the screen to some of the things that I've talked about, the cultural appropriation definition, the full report for the TRC, the calls to action. And then at the bottom, that link there, the Indigenous Relation Resources from the Indigenous Corporate Training Organization out of BC. I think they're a fabulous resource for any of the kind of questions that you may have uh, that are coming up around. I've seen things on medicine wheels on them, how to hold meetings with Indigenous people, they're actually a really great resource and I would consider them the experts actually on Indigenous inclusion when you're thinking about broader organization and programming stuff. So I will point you in that direction for additional resources. If there is any questions, I've got my contact information up there. Uh, follow SAS Culture on Twitter and Facebook. SAS Culture also has a number of re resources on our website that are available at www.sasculture.ca. So feel free to check out what's going on with us. We try to keep on, on the ball with things. So um, I think I'm ready to take some questions now if there's any out there. Great, thank you, Dominga. Um, we have had a few questions come in. Um, somebody was wondering, uh, you had those TRC call to action booklets. Where did you get those? Um, you can order these from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, they're, I believe they're about $11 um, each, and they're just like little great little handy things that go in your purse, so. Great. Um, Someone also said the word tribe is often used in marketing right now alongside squad. This feels improper, is it? Uh, tribe? No, it's not. We are those. Um, usually that's when you're talking about a nation. Um, so I am a, I'm from the Nakota tribe. Uh, our people are from across the border uh, and broader. Uh, it, is, it is okay to say tribal affiliation. There's nothing wrong with that. I think the question was more like this is my tribe for a social group how's used a little bit more colloquially lately oh um well you know people are going to take terms <laughs> i would almost consider that a cultural appropriation but i won't because it's an english word so you're going to see those things shift and change um i if i was not referencing an indigenous group i probably wouldn't use the word um there are other words that are available to use so Great, thanks. Um, what if you've accidentally done one of the don'ts on your list, used one of the inappropriate terms or uh, interacted perhaps in, a, in an inappropriate way, uh, what should a next step be? Um, apologize, <laughs> acknowledge that you've done something wrong um, and ask for, you know, ask them to, to still continue to work with you. Um, let them know 
where you're coming from in terms of your education on things and and be upfront about that you're trying and that you you're trying to learn and um usually uh, i mean sometimes you'll see that indigenous groups particularly elders will directly correct you on those things immediately um and will stop you <laughs> but if you get through something like that and you have made that mistake just acknowledge that you have and and ask for assistance moving forward okay thank you um two more i guess one person was asking you had all the links on the resource screen could you go back one slide sure can and we'll be able to post these as well, um, or the webinar will be all up online, so people will be able to see those later. Um, one more question. Uh, how do you know who to ask for ask for advice? Um, if you're wanting to reach out for consultation, uh, who should be someone that you should reach out to first? Um, depending on the entity that you're dealing with, if you are speaking with a reserve, uh, usually there's an education coordinator. That's always a good place to start. Um, they might have a community-based person. Uh, it varies per, per community, per organization. Uh, you might just want to call and ask. Um, that's what I will do. I'll be like, I'm looking to do some cultural work with you guys. Who is your cultural person? Who should I talk to? Uh, if you are at a loss to find that person, then go directly to the chief and talk to them about what you're trying to do. Once the chief endorses what you are wanting to do, he'll line up the people that you need to talk with and, and will, that will do the work with you. So I would say Atta uh, approaching the appropriate person if possible to take it up to the chief if not possible start at the chief and then he'll help you work downwards okay all right i think that is all the time for the questions that we have right now um i am going to be turning on uh the information for our next speaker thank you everyone yes thank you very much dominga All right, Christine, if you just want to begin your presentation and then we'll have a few minutes for questions after your talk as well. Um, so yes, um, just thank you, Dominga, and learning lots as we go along. I want to acknowledge that in Saskatchewan, we are always on treaty land. Right now here in Regina, I am on Treaty 4 territory, which is the traditional homeland of the Cree, of the Sato, of the Dakota, the Lakota, and the Nakota people. Um, it is also the traditional homeland of the Métis, and we honor all contributions. I also want to acknowledge, as an immigrant, the welcoming that I have received from all nations and all peoples in Saskatchewan. Um, I work for the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan. Our provincial motto is from many people's strengths. I'm just trying to move on my screen. Is it working for you? Yes, we can see you. Uh, you probably just have to hit the, the next arrow over. Okay. There you there. go. Thank you. Uh, so the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan, um, an organization that started in 1975, the multicultural values are rooted in the provincial motto from many people's strength and in the treaty relationships that define our province. They are expressed as respect for diversity, recognition and rejection of racism, intercultural connections and integration. So we acknowledge that multiculturalism is central to the cultural, social, economic, and political life of Saskatchewan. And the program that I specifically want to talk to you about today is a one that has come together as a collaboration. So after being involved in diversity planning in Saskatchewan, in cross-cultural communication efforts in diversity and inclusion on community level, 
on anti-racism workshops and intercultural relationships. Um, the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan partnered with the Aboriginal Friendship Centres of Saskatchewan, or AFCS, and the Saskatchewan Association for Immigrant Settlements and Integration Agencies, or SESHA. Now, MCOS is headquartered here in Regina, but we do work throughout the, uh, the province. The AFCS and SESHA are headquartered in Saskatoon, but also they do work and have um, settlement and friendship centers in most of the major centers in Saskatchewan. And they came together, this is before I started work for the organization, and they started a project that is named Bridges. And you can see on the screen, it stands for building relationships through intercultural dialogue and growing engagement in Saskatchewan. The objective for Bridges project was for the three organizations to engage in collaborative research and in planning processes and thereby to provide a snapshot of the current realities. They identified a high priority gap need to develop and to grow intercultural relationships between indigenous people, between the newcomers and between the descendants of settlers in Saskatchewan. Therefore, the emphasis is build, um, building those ongoing relationships. Um, Domenga spoke about it takes time and uh, it is a process. It's ongoing. You have to check in. Um, and throughout the project, this is one of the um, issues that in MCOS we really emphasize. You have to put in the work. And um, so they will allow these relationships then will allow for increased and more effective collaboration for planning, problem solving and activities that focus on the positive, whilst at the same time reducing the negatives, which are examples we see racism, systemic exclusion, discrimination and the negative impacts from cultural tensions. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background there, the, one of the findings was that um, there's a great deal going on in Saskatchewan, but most of it is short time and there are projects and activities that are not comprehensive models or collaborative efforts on a larger scale. They're quite short term projects. They depend on short time funding and they may be very localized between one or two groups. Well, obviously between two groups. Um, so part of the procedure then was to have a research process and a literary review was undertaken and a series of interviews took place with key organizations across Saskatchewan and different parts of the country. And the goal was to identify any potential models for use and adaptations so they didn't want to reinvent that wheel and to collect information about existing successes as well as lessons learned. And the outcome was to learn from the experience of others and to have a better understanding of the current environment. Um, just to let you know as well, this was done before the 2016 election in our southern neighbor. Um, and we have since then, certainly um, you may be aware of it as well, seen an increase in overt open racism. Um, it's like the bandage was pulled off from that open sore. Um, and now it is, um, yeah, it's getting some oxygen and people are feeling more emboldened. And this has an impact as well. So after that, the community consultations that took place, um, there were four different ones that were held in Prince Albert, in Saskatoon, in Yorkton, and then in Regina as well, um, by people from throughout the province. And the goal was to share uh, the research findings and to build on it, and as well to hear from frontline agencies and a range of individuals about their experience and their thoughts. So um, partner teamwork then resulted in a goal that was set to reflect each organization's mandate and needs throughout the project to share expertise and to share contacts and to do the research together 
and to um, set shared goals as well. I'm going to share a few of the key findings. Now, it was found that very few initiatives have been evaluated for impact. And if you're an organization that applies for funding and sponsorship, um, you will know that outcomes and impact is something that your funder or sponsor is very interested in for good reason. Um, all these little projects that take place, if, if the funders and sponsors don't know, uh, what the outcomes are, um, they may want to rethink their sponsorship, but also for the organizations that are putting on and putting a lot of work into these activities and events, um, you might want to build on that in future and, and not repeat the same activity year after year or season after season. Um, the possibilities to build on and to grow uh, are really exciting. Uh, and, and just to let you know as well, if you go to the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan or MCOS's website, the full report is available there as well uh, under Bridges. Uh, it's one of our programs. Uh, another interesting thing was organization staff that stated that they are very aware of the lack of interaction and of the increased levels of tension. Um, that the needs must be understood, but that there's both a, a very strong will, but a hesitance and um, an inability to address these needs and to address the increased levels of tension and how to go about. So definitely a webinar like today and uh, what Domingo was just sharing with us, that's a wonderful resource for us. Um, when another key finding then is that there is still a disproportionate number of white committee members or agency representatives working with an increasingly diverse population. Reciprocity in people educating each other, sharing stories and engaging with curiosity and respect is very important. Stereotypes, myths and assumptions still form the basis of many people's beliefs, creating a significant need for increased awareness, training and information sharing. Media plays a very large role in this messaging as well. Uh, it is important to identify and to address needs and barriers. And when events and activities take place, um, issues such as access to transportation, childcare, these are significant in determining the success of events and activities. So there's recognition that this work requires long-term, multi-year, stable funding because trust and relationships require this time, shared space and shared objectives to build. I'd like to share with you that as the program has continued and the project is um, gaining momentum, uh, we have gained partners as well, uh, such as the Regina Open Door Society and uh, Affinity Credit Union. We are partnering in different locations with different organizations. Uh, in Regina, for instance, we have a youth engagement section, uh, Regina Youth Bridges. And we've been partnering, for instance, with the Regina Open Door Society, with North Central Family Center, with Nevo Yotina Friendship Center, with Rainbow Youth Center in Prince Albert, uh, where the pilot project started. They partnered also with friendship centers, but then also with the YMCA as well. So these grow, I like to think of them as um, in this war against racism um, and in our intercultural competency building, I like to think of these agencies and their staff as secret agents that carry with them this mission to um, build a world of integration that is safe space for everybody. 
in Saskatoon, um, we have a group um, as part of the Pro Bridges project that is now renamed itself. Initially, it was Saskatoon Bridges. They renamed themselves, or we have um, as part of them. I, I need to emphasize that the three partners do not say control. They support, they facilitate. Um, so in Saskatoon, the group's name is Culturenet. And they have monthly meetings where all intercultural um, organizations are invited to attend. It's open invitation every month. They have a core group of members who always attend. Um, and they share resources. It's information sharing. It's resource sharing. It's as simple as we're having a multicultural day next Thursday. Um, this is what we're planning to do. Uh, is somebody else having the same event on the same day in the same location? How can we avoid those kind of conflicts? Um, and how can we work together? In Regina, we had a wonderful recent um, event with the youth um, supported through multiple agencies. And um, I'm just going to let you know a little bit about that with the next slide. My name is Rosen Stonechild. I'm making oh, use buffalo hide and paint. And it's like a little canvas. I use like a butter knife and we scrape off like, we scrape off some of the hide so it's like rough. My name is Shireen, uh, Shireen al -Musallim. I'm from Syria. We just clean our raw eye until it's smooth and good to add to art on it. My name is... The project, um, I'm running out of time here. I apologize. I'm, um, there's so much to share. The project was intercultural learning amongst groups of youth, newcomers, refugees, and then learning together with indigenous youth and um, being hosted by Commonweal and learning about Buffalo teachings, the friendships, the relationships that are built, they are inspiring, they are amazing. Um, if anybody has any questions, I would like to invite those at this moment. All right, thank you very much, Christine. Um, so we have a little bit of time for a few questions. Um, the first one is, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the youth project. Mm -hmm. um, what interested the youth about taking part in that program? So many, um, the, the comments that we have from the youth is building friendships. Um, the learning together, it's for them, it's about the relationships. Yes, they love to learn it. They love to learn and share. I can just tell you that at one of the projects that was youth-led actually recently, um, it was just wonderful to see that they started their program for the day with land acknowledgement. And this was done by a little newcomer group and they were presenting to um, a completely new refugee group coming in. Um, so they like to learn. They love to learn from each other and mostly friendships. That's great. Um, and how did you connect with the youth that took part? How did you uh, find mm -hmm. them and tell them about the program? Absolutely. Uh, Regina Open Door Society has a um, group of youth who registered with them. Um, they are very big here in Regina. And um, so the newcomer and refugee youth are already part of their programming. And so we reached out as well. We work with the Naval Yotina um, Friendship Center as well with North Central Family Center. Both of these groups have youth programs as well. And then recently, we've connected with the Rainbow Youth Center here, as well as with Street Culture Kids. Um, so we do initially, it's very important to rely on those relationships and programs that already exist. But again, I have to tell you, it's um, constantly, like Domingo pointed out as well, the face-to-face -face meetings, the building of trust, building of the relationship between the program um, staff as well. 
Hmm. All right. Um, those are all the questions that we've received so far. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for providing yeah. that example. Um, we are going to be moving on to uh, one more example of a successful program. Um, so I'm going to be passing the microphone over to Chantelle Umstead, um, and she's going to be talking a little bit about something that happened in Moose Jaw recently. Um, so Chantelle, I can see that your microphone is live. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, and we can see your presentation, so you're good to Perfect. go. Thank awesome. you. So, bonjour à tous. Hello, everyone. I want to first acknowledge that we're on Treaty 4 territory here in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And uh, I've been learning a lot since the beginning with Dominga and Christine's presentation. Thank you both. And I want to say that I am not a specialist by any means, but I've been asked to uh, talk about today a past working experience our association had with both Indigenous and Métis communities. So as you can see on the first slide of my presentation, our event was named Sharing Our Heritage, Past, Present and Future and took place during Culture Days 2017. To give you an idea of where we're going, here's the plan of my presentation. I'll start with a bit of background on how our Culture Day took shape and who was part of the project. Then I'll describe the event and activities that took place that day. Afterwards, I'll mention our challenges and how we overcame them, them as well as our successes. And finally, I'll show you some pictures taking the day of the event. So back in spring 2017, a number of Moose Jaw community organizations got together for an information session about organizing an, a Culture Days event in our city. Following our initial meeting, it was decided that we would be more successful, successful pardon, in attaining funding through Culture Days if we applied in two smaller hubs with distinct themes. We had the arts and multiculturalism and the organizations would fit into one or the other category. As you probably inferred, <laughs> we formed the Multiculturalism Hub. As you, um, the organizations that were involved in our hub were the Association Communautaire Francasquoise de Moussia, so the French community, the New Southern Plain Métis Local Number 160, the Wakama Aboriginal Community Association, the Western Development Museum, and the Moose Jaw Multicultural Council. To give you an idea of the event itself, it took place outdoors at the amphitheater of Crescent Park in Moose Jaw from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. There was a show taking place in the afternoon from 1 to 4 with performances by artists from different communities, Indigenous, Métis, and Francophone. And some of them even offered interactive activities, such as learning how to play the spoons, learning how to jig. Visitors were invited to stop by an indigenous camp, a Métis camp, as well as a voyageur camp to get to know about the first people that lived in Canada. Each camp offered different activities and shared information about their respective communities and culture. The Western Development Museum had an interactive discovery box with artifacts from the fur trade times. The Moose Jaw Multicultural Council also had a tent to inform visitors on what it takes to become a Canadian nowadays. And finally, there was also a box where people were invited to leave their thoughts on how they imagine our future together. As for activities, to be more specific, uh, the indigenous TP had some high, high scraping, some smudging, they thought how to show respect and also offered bannock to the visitors. At the MIT camp, there was beating and mischief words were thought. At the Voyageur camp, people were invited to make their own beard and they could also go for a canoe ride. <laughs> At the Western Development Museum, they had a buffalo coat people could try on and there's also some crafts, so beaver face and canoe were the two offered. The Moose Jaw Multicultural Council had, an inf had a lot of information regarding the steps a newcomer has to go through to become a Canadian. And there was also, as I mentioned earlier, a cultural show with artists from the Indigenous, Métis and Francophone community. Now, <laughs> let's get in the challenges and successes and how we overcame them. So first, I found it really difficult to communicate via email since not everybody would take the time to reply. 
So as the Minga mentioned, and luckily we found out that it was working much better uh, when we had regular meetings in person. So we had them about once a month and it helped us to keep everybody up to date. We had some issues with people showing up later and sometimes canceling, but we were really patient and made sure everybody got the whole information before leaving the meeting, which leads me to talk about the notion of time. So we've come to realize that in the case of our project, the indigenous community didn't have the same notion of time as we did. Whether it was for meetings, for the event itself, or handing invoices and receipts at the end of the project. So um, the example that marked me the most was for the event. So it started at 11 a.m. and we all agreed to arrive at 10 a.m. to make sure we had enough time to set up and coordinate everything uh, once uh, at the day of the event. Uh, but the indigenous community showed up at 10.45, so 15 minutes before the event, and they weren't ready when it started. So that was one of the biggest difference that I noticed in uh, terms of time. And what, ha what helped us during the event to make sure we were following the schedule uh, was to um, have a schedule for the show, first of all, and an MC that was making sure everything was running smoothly during the show. And we also had asked every community to bring a CD with traditional music so that we could use it as a background music when people weren't ready on time for the show. So that helped us fill in the gaps. Another struggle we had, just like for every type of event, I would say, was to find volunteers. So each association worked on finding their own volunteers, but it wasn't easy and we would have had appreciate to have more volunteers so that the members of the organization committee would have had more time to visit the other communities set up without having to leave a position no one else could fill in for. We turned out to have the minimum people we needed, which was good, but yeah, ideally we would have had more. <laughs> Um, also, training activity. So at first, it was supposed to be our main activity to be able to connect um, the different communities together that day. So um, to give you a little idea of what that activity was, if visitors were starting at the Voyageur camp, so that's the Francophone camp, they would have been invited to make themselves a beard that they would have proudly wore to go exchange with the other communities. When I speak about exchange, we had printed some pictures and they all had um, a link to the community they were leaving from. So <laughs> the people at the Voyageur camp would have had to realize that with their beards, indigenous and Métis people wouldn't accept to trade with them because it was a mark of disrespect. So they would have been confronted to a cultural shock and voyageurs would try to get furs in exchange of firearms and jewelry made out of glass beads. So this idea was to um, be able to connect the different communities, as I said earlier, and to allow the visitors to have a taste of what it was like during colonization time. Unfortunately, we couldn't make that activity possible because no one really took the lead to develop the tools for the activity. And even if we got part of it done, so like the pictures, for example, there wasn't enough time to develop it and um, no one could really be in charge without neglecting its own camp since we struggled to find volunteers. <laughs> so that was our fourth struggle. And then finally, we had a great location. Uh, it was outdoors, amphitheater, we had enough room for everybody. But um, even though we had great weather, we should have planned uh, plan B in case of rain. Um, we didn't have to, but we would have not been in a good position if it started raining right at the beginning. <laughs> so now let's pass on to the successes we had. Um, since the ACFMJ, so the organization I work for, had a change of director between grant application and execution of the project, we had to make sure that I don't understood everything about the project because I had to somehow lead it. So the first meeting was really successful. I had the chance to meet everyone 
and make sure that we were on the same page regarding activities and budget. So we agreed on common expenses, such as park rental, sound technician, insurances, and so on. But it was really important for us to give autonomy to every community so that they could represent their cultures as authentically as possible. So we had common expenses, which was part of the budget, and then we split, let's say, three grants in three for the main communities. So Francophone, Métis, and Indigenous had each a grant for their own um, little camp, TP, or whatever activities they wanted to plan to show their culture. And a week prior to the event, to make sure we would spend every single dollar, we had another meeting and um, kind of wrapped up on our different expenses. Also, a really good thing we had was a volunteer orientation session. So it was for us the, the main, main meeting, main, uh, main moment to make sure everybody um, would know about the main activities that were going on during the day. And each group had also some time to split up in smaller groups to speak to their volunteers individually. So it allowed everyone to have a general idea of what was going to happen and what their role was during the event. It really is a must do. I've never done a volunteer orientation before, but I've seen how uh, important and great it was for everybody to understand what they were going to be involved in. And finally, what helped helped us promote our event and make sure people would show up was that we had a great media coverage before, during, and also after the event. So we used every contact we had within the different associations and were on a variety of media, such as the radio, newspapers, social medias, and we also made some cross promotion with uh, a hub that was actually our neighbor the day of the event. All right, and yeah, finally, <laughs> the event allowed the visitors to get Im immersed in the culture of each and every community that was represented, and they could visit them, and they had like their own ways to tell people how their culture was, so that was a really important part of our project to make sure cultures feel, felt respected and felt like they could really show who they are, where they're from, and any other things that were related to their culture. So it was really good success. We had great feedback and the respect of every culture was through the autonomy we gave each other for the different expenses and so on. And now I am gonna show you a couple pictures and give some explanations regarding the ones that need some more or not. So let's go. First of all, that was our location. It was at the amphitheater in Crescent Park in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. As you can see on the picture, we the first tent on the left was the one from the Newcomer Welcome Center. And then the first TP to your left was the Indigenous TP. Then we had the Métis TP. And a little bit more out there to the right, which is kind of brown, was the Voyageur Camp. So that's how we set up everything. And the stage was used for the show during the day. And as you can kind of see, uh, there are benches that were um, directed towards the, the, the amphitheater, so where the show was taking place, which allowed a lot of people to just stop by, sit down, and enjoy whichever show was going on. This is a picture of the opening ceremony. So as we planned our activity, we uh, took the time to question Indigenous and Métis communities to know how they would do it if they would have to start a ceremony or anything like that. So one thing they mentioned is a, a walking in ceremony. So there's two members of the WACA organizations that walk, organization, sorry, that walked in the different speakers we had. And before they started speaking, we also had an elder that was giving the prayer and so on. So we had to take the time to get to know the culture and how they would do it to be to make sure that we would respect them and it would felt respected and would be there um, for us for the event. Here we have a picture of the drummers that were there from the Waka 
um, association and they had part of the show during the afternoon. <laughs> Here we have a fiddle and a guitar player that were there for the METI community. Um, this is part of the Spoon Show slash workshop. So it was there to represent the French community. And uh, luckily we had enough spoons for everybody to join in and practice and get to know how it's, uh, it's done. So that was the person that was performing the workshop. Here we have two pictures. So the first one is the information table we had at the Voyageur Tarp. So it was more about fur and exchanges and the new Francescois sash. So Francescois is the term we use to speak about the French speaking people in Saskatchewan. Um, so yeah, people were stopping by trying to understand where we're from and uh, what was part of our culture. And then we had some height scraping for, from the indigenous uh, community. So that was really good because people could also try it. So that was great. Then we had some great pictures with um, indigenous people that were um, showing us some dance moves and were really uh, into their cultures. And I think it was really impressive with the colors and the costumes we're not used to see in any other context. Here's an another information table. So a table where the METI displayed artifacts and pictures. <laughs> this is the canoe we used um, for the Voyageur camp to allow people to kind of experience as if they were traveling on the river. They had to imagine it because the canoe was on the wheels. Um, I really like this picture because it shows that there's a mix of people from different cultures that were there during the day and that experienced other cultures. So I really, yeah, I really like this picture therefore. And here we uh, ended up the show, the ceremony, the event with a big round dance with every visitor, members of the communities that were there. And I also really like this picture because it shows a lot of multiculturalism. It really um, shows how different we can be, but that even though we come from different cultures, we can get together, enjoy the differences and get to know about each other's culture. And finally, this is a final picture of the members of our comedy. So you can see the names and where they're from at the bottom. So this sums up my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And I thank you all for your attention. And I wish you all to learn as much as I did when I work with the indigenous and the Métis community. So I think it would be time for questions, Megan. <laughs> all right, thank you very much for the discussion, Chantel. Yeah. Um, if you do have a question, please type that into the box on the webinar platform. Uh, the first one that came in uh, said that you worked with a lot of people and it sounded like there was a lot going on in your program. Uh, how did how early did you start the planning and do you feel like it was enough time? Um, we started, so our first meeting was before the grant application. So I wasn't there because I wasn't director at that time, but it was even before the grant application. And then we waited to know if we were accepted for the grant before meeting up again afterwards. So it started mm, by memory. Uh, in July, we had a meeting. So we started really early <laughs> to make sure we wouldn't forget anything and we'd have enough time. I would say we had enough time except for the common project, such as the trading activity we wanted to build. Every other organization was busy throughout the day with other activities, so it made it more difficult to work on common projects. So that's why I would say this one project kind of felt through. Um, a little bit more time would have been great to be able to build on the trading activity, for example. But regarding every single camp, um, I think we did have enough act, enough time to build like the main frame for activity. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think actually we have a few minutes for uh, questions that we can direct towards everybody. Um, so Christine and Dominga, we will just be turning on your microphones right now so you can jump in with other questions. Um, and um, 
I guess the first one, someone was asking about the treaty territory statement, um, where you guys get your information so you can learn what treaty you're on. Uh, we have, we, there's a website that we've used for our own and we can circulate that to everybody. Um, but uh, do any of the three of you have a recommended place to, to learn about what treaty you are currently residing in? I usually go to the Government of Canada. They have a website which shows the history of the treaties and a, a good map on those types of things. And then this is another question where you need to ask community. Um, they will tell you who, whose territories you are on. So, um, But I would go Government of Canada, treaty land map. They'll show you a map of, of that. All right. Thank you. Um, I think that'll be useful. And uh, yeah, we can just share those links with everybody. Um, again, a few more opportunities for people to ask questions. You can type those in. Uh, we did have one that came in a little bit earlier. Someone was saying uh, that they were wondering if Indigenous peoples find being labeled and lumped into multicultural, multiculturalism as demeaning or diminishing of their status. Um, does anyone have uh, any thoughts on that? I do. Um, absolutely not. I think having a multicultural event and not including Indigenous people is probably more offensive. Um, there's Sure, there's a nation, a nation there, but the term multicultural is just that, multiple cultures. So, um, yeah, I don't see an issue with that. And you'll see, um, we want to see more of those types of things happening. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll leave another few seconds for any other questions to come in. Uh, we're all very excited to see the other programs that are going to be coming um, through through Moose Jaw and the NCOS. Um, all right, just a lot of people saying thank you for the webinar. So uh, just a reminder that the Culture Days weekend is coming up September 28th, 29th and 30th of this year. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers. Uh, we re all really appreciated having you share your information and insights on this webinar. Um, details of the webinar uh, are, have been recorded and will be posted on our website in about a week. So it's a great opportunity to share details or if you missed anything to go back. Um, we have another webinar that will be coming up in July, uh, details to be confirmed. Uh, if you want to know about any of our webinars or our resources, uh, you can sign up for the Culture Days newsletter. Uh, it's a great way, great way to keep abreast of all the Culture Days news. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, there will be a brief survey that will launch following this webinar, and I encourage you all to take it, just so we have a little bit more information about uh, what you thought of the past hour. Thank you very much for joining us, and we can't wait to see you soon.